Peter, thanks very much for joining us. We've got My a pleasure. bracket going on on defence and security with these conversations. And uh, you seem to be a very, very uh, uh, appropriate person to talk to. You've been doing a lot of writing specifically uh, as the CEO of ASPE, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. You've got about 40 people. You're the premier think tank on defence and security and crisis management in Australia, advising the federal government and putting forward public policy ideas. Tell us about ASPE from your perspective and why it's important. Well, uh, John, firstly, thank you for, for asking me on. And um, ASPE is an unusual beast. Uh, it, it was really the creation of John Howard. And um, uh, it came about, I think, um, in the, the year 99 and 2000, um, which was a, a high point of military operations for mm -hmm. Australia. We, we had deployed our forces into um, East Timor for a major stabilisation operation. And um, f that operation went very well, but Howard came out of it, I think, feeling dissatisfied with some of the advice that he'd received from the Defence Department. And he felt that um, what was needed was a, almost a sort of a ginger group that would be able to put the department on its mettle by providing what Howard called contestability of policy advice. So he created ASPE uh, as a, as a government-owned company, in fact, uh, but with an explicit charter saying you, you are to be independent on what you research and uh, what you say publicly about defence and security issues. Um, as, as I think about it now, uh, you know, 20 years later, it really was the act of uh, a, a politician who was kind of like very comfortable in his position as, as Prime Minister. I'm not sure that subsequent governments might have been so comfortable to actually invite a, a sort of a critic into the, into the House. And it's true to say that for the first um, 15 years of Aspie's operation, defence was pretty reserved about it as well. Um, you, know, you know what Canberra's like, it's a very turfy environment. Uh, but we're now in our 20th year of operation. Um, we're now 50 staff, in fact. We've got a big um, operation working on cyber security, which is just growing uh, exponentially. And um, I, I think uh, you'd expect me to say this, but I, I, I think we're actually doing really good work in terms of uh, keeping a public focus on what the key strategic issues are and also helping governments and oppositions think their way through about those big investment decisions around military capability. Uh, and just as importantly, um, you know, how Australia manages its international position uh, at a time when, you know, we're seeing um, a very unpredictable and increasingly risky international environment. So that, that's what ASPE does. So a lot of people simply refer to it as a, as a think tank. Uh, but I, I take some emphasis in wanting us to be very close to the policy community and trying to be as constructive as we can be at the same time as we're also from, from time to time critical of aspects of government policy. You raised something that's worried me for many years and of course I, I was there at the time when ASPE was set up, which is that we seem to have an enormous defence bureaucracy. In fact, sometimes it seems to me that it almost overshadows the people in uniform it's enormous, and I really wonder sometimes how fleet of foot and how able it is to respond quickly and effectively to changing global circumstances. Well, it's a, it's a big organisation, and um, indeed I, I was one before uh, uh, before I went to ASPE. My, my last uh, defence job was uh, being the Deputy Secretary for Strategy. Um, at that time, about 21,000 civilians in the defence organisation. And that does sound like a lot. I, I, I can't. Uh, I can't gainsay that. But re remember, that covers everything from uh, uh, base maintenance through to um, people that are actually acquiring the equipment which the defence forces use. Uh, the people that were in what you might call front end policy jobs, uh, like the one I was doing, were, were, were fairly small. Uh, do you know? I, I, I think the problem that. Um, you're, you're touching on there is one that's that's quite broad throughout the public service right now, which is that the, the whole organisation has become so risk averse that they're not really coming forward to government with innovative ideas. And in fact, this is something that successive prime ministers have complained about, that you know what, what they get from the bureaucracy is incrementalism. 
but new ways of thinking um, and a sort of agility to deal with fast moving issues is something that large public service organisations don't do very well. Um, and by contrast, it's what think tanks, I think, do, do quite well because we're small, we're hungry, uh, you know, we want people to listen to us and, and we know that for that to happen, we have to have new and original things to say. So it's actually quite a very a different environment uh, uh, in ASPE than it was from my experience working in a large defence bureaucracy. Which is part of the reason why I'm delighted to talk to you because, I, you know, I think think tanks have a very important, very, very important role to play. Uh, and I do know what you mean by that Canberra bubble. I'll be really blunt and say that I think, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I, I sometimes, as I think back over it, all those years that I was on the National Security Committee of Cabinet, uh, that there were times when the senior brass felt they had to obey the rules rather than tell us what they really thought as well. Anyway, yeah, that'll there's... probably invite some uh, furious blowback from certain quarters, but that is a distinct impression I had at times. I, look, you, you, you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a long-term resident of Canberra and I've, I've grown to love the place over the years, but, but you do have to wonder if the design of, of the federal capital was the best thing that ever happened in, in the Commonwealth of Australia because what it did was it separated public policy from the business community. It kind of isolated it in a town where a lot of people will have discussions that are extremely important, sort of theological discussions about what's important inside different government departments. And it's also very turfy. Uh, it's very focused on who's in power, who's got control. And um, in some ways, those things, I think, leave um, normal Australians somewhat nonplussed or, or, or disinterested. It, it's it's different even in, in London or Washington where government in some ways seems to be a bit closer to populations uh, and there's a larger group of people that want to actually get in and argue about what right what the right policy settings should be. So, you know, Canberra needs to get out of town more or at least their officials uh, and their politicians do to uh, kind of sell their message to a wider audience and make sure that Australians understand what policy settings mean and, and why they are the way they are, um, or at least, you know, force governments to explain them more effectively. Because all of this leads to something that I suspect is not top of mind, not often recognised. The chief role of the Federal Government of Australia is actually the security of its people. Absolutely. Including Absolutely. in defence, but in this very different age we live in now, all of the other sort of cyber aspects yes, of yes. ensuring that we are able to live in freedom in our country. Yeah, and I, and I think those, those issues are becoming much more challenging. Uh, you know, it, it is clear that the Constitution makes national security the number one responsibility. Of Why we came together in the first place. Yeah, indeed. And, uh, but, you know, I think, that, truth be told, um, you know, we have tended to ride on America's coattails for decades, um, allowing America to do most of the heavy lifting on security in the Asia Pacific region. That's why we've been able to get away with comparatively low levels of defence expenditure. Um, and to give you one example of that, when I left the department in 2012, there was a bit of a squeeze on the defence budget because the, uh, the, the Gillard government of the day was uh, trying to get uh, the overall Commonwealth budget into surplus, so defence spending had been reduced. Um, in 2012, defence spending was 1.7% of gross national product. And ASPE actually weighed into that debate to say, well, the last time our expenditure was that low, it was in fact 1937. Uh, so, you know, I, I have felt uh, for some time that successive Australian governments, and, and I mean this in a, in a bipartisan way, have, have not taken the defence and national security function as seriously as they should. And certainly not as seriously as it needs to be taken when, when you look at what's happening in in the region and globally, uh, which present, I think, quite quite immediate and dramatic security problems for Australia. Let's then open this right up. Uh, and you were instrumental, of course, in the last of the white papers. Perhaps we should just, I mean, for people who are not used to the bubble, what is a white paper on defence? We had one in 2016. What is it firstly? Secondly, the world has changed dramatically even since 2016. Yes. 
and yet we're not talking about it enough in Australia. You see during election campaigns and so forth, amazingly little defence uh, spoken about. The, the, the very different, and I would argue, much more uncertain world that we now live in. Yeah. Yeah. And if security of the people is the premier objective of government, firstly, what's a white paper, but then of more importance, as a leading advisor to government, what is it that you think, let's go to uh, what, how you see the world, the most important things that we need to know as a people and our governments need to be responding to. Mm -hmm. So white paper first, okay. then onto the broader picture. Well, white papers are these rather um, iconic um, statements of policy in, in the defence world, uh, which uh, has seen uh, since the early 1970s about seven or eight white papers that have been produced over that period of time. They're meant to be public documents, um, and they're really about helping government to explain to the Australian uh, audience and, and indeed to an international community. So why are we spending what we're spending on defence? What are the priorities? Um, and in, a, in, a, in an unclassified way, what, wh where are the threats? Where, you know, what is it that we're actually structuring our defence force to, to deal with? And as you say, the last one uh, we had in Australia, John, uh, was begun in uh, uh, 2014 and finished in uh, February of uh, 2016. Um, and I, I did indeed play an advisory role to the, to, to the government as, as an external expert panel um, chair uh, to sort of test the, the, the document as it went through its various stages of development. Um, I can't say it was necessarily an easy thing to do because we had two prime ministers and three ministers for defence over the life of this particular document and that, that had its own impact. But at the end of the day, it's a statement about how we spend the money had, where, where is the threat and um, you know what what are the equipment solutions that we we want the defense force to be uh, to be thinking about as, as I think about it um, uh, well I'd, I'd make two points on it F firstly um, I, I think it's quite likely that a future government of whatever political stripe uh, will commission another document and the reason for that is because the pace of strategic changes as you've said has, is moving so quickly. Uh, that we have to make sure our, our policies are, are designed to deal with, you know, those emerging future problems rather than the things that might have been worrying uh, people two years ago. One example of that, at almost exactly the time the Defence White Paper was commissioned by Tony Abbott in 2014, China started its island building, its island construction in, in the South China Sea. And at the time our Defence White Paper was released in February of 2016, China had by then built three fully functioning complex military air bases in the South China Sea in the time it had taken us to produce a, a policy statement. So that's the number one problem. So in the time that we were writing a paper, yes. they managed to military, well, basically create uh, several military bases on things that almost, it's just specks in the ocean. Yes, that's exactly right. They, they reclaimed um, about 3,000 um, hectares of land. It was one of the most amazing sort of civil engineering projects that you'll see, uh, leaving an open question as to how good the engineering was that, that actually produced these facilities. But it was the maritime equivalent of um, the Russian annexation of Crimea. Um, and I, I think because it happened at sea, people didn't necessarily see this as being serious in a, in a military way. Certainly the Obama administration decided that it was just a dispute over a bunch of rocks and that they, they didn't want to jeopardise the relationship with China uh, to respond strongly to this issue. But, uh, but how many have they built since 2016? How many have we got there now? Well, we have three. No, they, they have consolidated it around three functioning air bases. And um, these are military grade runways of about 3,000 metres. <clears throat> They've got protected hangar facilities, which would actually house um, the aircraft of the entire Australian Air Force in terms of the numbers of aircraft which they can house down there. They've got self protection of uh, missile batteries. Um, in other words, th this is serious. It's not just a token planting of a flag on a, on a beach to say uh, we own this territory. 
Um, it's a, a development which means that China controls the airspace over the South China Sea, which is about 80% of the size of the Mediterranean. It's a, it's a major piece of geography. And why it matters to us is, is because, you know, it's a very significant part of our trade uh, moves through that region up north, not simply to China, but also to Japan and to um, South Korea. Um, and it's a region that um, is absolutely critical to Japan because Japan is entirely dependent on oil and liquid natural gas supplies from uh, the Middle East, which comes through the Straits of Malacca, where Singapore is, and then turns up to Asia through the set through the South China Sea. So, um, you know, this is not an esoteric dispute. It kind of goes to economic and energy lifelines for countries in the region. And from a Chinese perspective, it was a very um, successful strategic strike. So, illegal, uh, completely found to be illegal by yes. international law. Indeed, yes, that's right. I mean, the, 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 there were a number of uh, disputed claims over the territories that China um, uh, militarized. Um, China has chosen to ignore any international legal judgments about how those disputes should be handled and simply asserts that it has the sovereignty of, of control. And really the world has, has accepted that um, uh, in, the, in the absence of any more um, uh, authoritative response from America or from the countries of the region, well, China kind of has a de facto control and that's how it's going to, going to stay. So, you know, that itself is a, is a part of a much bigger story about how China has moved uh, from being a country that was, um, as, as Deng Xiaoping said, um, biding its time and hiding its capabilities to a country under Xi Jinping uh, that is becoming much more assertive, uh, really much more dominating of how the region should run. Um, and uh, I think becoming, you know, a, a, a first and foremost, the biggest strategic risk that Australia now faces. Because it's not a defence force as such that they appear to be constructing. Well, um, uh, it goes you know, well beyond the, the, mere self-defence. The, the instruments of uh, Chinese power start with its economy, which of course is um, huge and, and growing, but also very fragile. Um, a, an immensely powerful Chinese Communist Party whose number one priority is to stay in power. And Xi Jinping, who as the pre as the president of uh, of China, has decided that he's uh, going to do away with any rivalry inside the party or the or the military, so that he remains personally in power himself for an indefinite an indefinite period. So you know this is a rising, um, aggressively authoritarian state that is challenging the United States for supremacy in the Asia Pacific region. And really saying to all the other countries of the region, Japan, ourselves, countries of Southeast Asia, well, we're in charge and you guys have to live with that. Now, I, I think this presents you know, a major problem for Australia because so much of our wealth has been generated in the last 30 years by trading with China and by building close relations. But we used to tell ourselves during that time, well, China was going to open up, you know, the party might not last forever, that is, the Communist Party might Well, the idea was forever. that if we engage with them trade-wise, built their wealth, model something better, they yes. want what we have, That's not right. just material wealth, but they'd want our freedoms. In fact, the, in fact, the line was that they were slowly going to become more like Singapore. So, you know, more open, more controlled, economically successful. What uh, Xi Jinping has done has sort of removed that off, off the agenda. They're, they're becoming more authoritarian, more controlling you know, significant violations of human rights. Let's drill in into that for a moment, because we know, and there are reasons for it, everything from the cost of housing through to the relentless attacks on our way of life from the media and much of academia, that a lot of young Australians, the Lowy Institute's invaluable work in this area yeah. confirms it, are quite disillusioned with democracy. But yeah. as Churchill said, you know, that's all very well until you consider the alternatives. Let's drill into the sort of society that China's turning into, the, the social credits system and the extraordinary surveillance that accompanies it. So the state's watching what everybody, I mean, it involves all sorts of things, human rights, mm 
the massive use of technology. Technology itself is always morally neutral, but what you do with it is a different matter altogether. You know, so a toaster is morally neutral. Um, you can be morally toast. neutral, but it can be used for extraordinarily yeah. uh, you know, beneficial or evil purposes. This technology race is a big part of it. So just explore this because it gives us a deep insight yes. into the sort of society that the Chinese Communist Party regards as ideal. Well, I guess since the 1970s, there's been a trade-off that the Communist Party has uh, really sold to the Chinese people, which is to say, well, we're not, we're not democratic, but we are delivering growth and improving living standards. And, and that was the basis of the legitimacy of the, of the Communist Party, was that it was lifting you know, tens of millions of Chinese people out of, out of poverty. And indeed, that happened very successfully for, for a, number of, uh, a number of decades. I, I think what we're seeing now is a realisation that the party has, that it may not be able to deliver high levels of economic growth indefinitely, that the economy is maturing, growth is slowing, uh, but the aspirations of the Aging Chinese population. people, you know, are, are not changing. The, the demography is working against China, um, hence the, the claim that they may well get old before they get wealthy. Um, but the party still wants to remain in control. So at the same time as the economy is starting to falter, what, what we're seeing is uh, the, the Communist Party is putting in place the mechanisms of social control that can keep it in power even if they're failing on their social compact to deliver to the Chinese people. Um, and a large part of this uh, comes through what is now being called a social credit system. Now, a social credit system is actually a score which you as an individual Chinese citizen will receive. It's, it's out of 800. At birth? Uh, well, from birth, yep, you'll, you'll be part of the system. That will measure things like, for example, uh, whether you pay your credit cards on time, your, your debt worthiness, uh, your uh, criminal records if you have it. Um, but it will also measure, John, um, things like um, how, how closely you support the party. Are there any indications that you might actually not support the party on issues like Taiwan or the South China Sea or the treatment of uh, Uyghurs in, uh, in Xinjiang province? And if you're rated on your social credit system to be perhaps not completely trustworthy, uh, what that will mean is that firstly, you'll be unable to join the Communist Party, which is the number one path to personal success in China. You won't be able to travel abroad. Your study and employment uh, opportunities will be severely constrained. Um, and um, so this is becoming a mechanism for controlling the population of you know 1.3 billion people, almost on an hour by hour basis. Now, how does how does China do this? Well, it's um, the the most um, advanced array of surveillance cameras. Uh, with I read somewhere 400 million closed circuit televisions. It, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, I mean, certainly down the east coast, that that would be true. Uh, which is also connected to biometric data about um, you as an individual. And, and there's a famous case of um, uh, a Chinese person who had been committed of some petty crimes actually being picked out of a, I think it was a soccer audience of about 30,000 people in a stadium through the use of biometric devices to identify that person. So, you know, you don't have to be a Leninist, even though Xi Jinping is, to sort of understand how that can... Uh, move into very tight political control of, of people's life aspirations. Something that we should be worried about is, is that the party also sees this as a way of managing what they call um, overseas Chinese, but that you and I might call um, um, Australians of uh, Chinese ethnicity. Uh, so China makes no acknowledgement of uh, people, Chinese overseas as being anything other than overseas Chinese that are, should be responsive to the party. Well, they actually insist, um, do they not, that their first loyalty is in fact to Beijing? Well, that, that is the expectation. And, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, many, many people of Chinese background in Australia came here precisely to avoid that type of party control. But there's also been a large number of uh, Chinese people that have come in usually under student visas over the last 20 or so years that have now found themselves as uh, citizens. 
that have deep ties back uh, to the PRC and who feel the pressure of this um, uh, social credit system quite quite substantially because it impacts on their families back home. I, I, I've met uh, a young Chinese person yeah. who is in fear for her family. Yeah. So, you know, uh, this perhaps d diverts us a little bit, but to give you an example, uh, the, the Australian National University was publicly acknowledged to have been hacked by Chinese intelligence services last year. And um, one of the key interests that the intelligence services have apart from intellectual property theft, is to get into university-moderated chat rooms to see what their overseas students are saying when they're studying here in Australia. And if there's an indication that, you know, a student might be uh, talking about democracy, for example, in, in favourable terms, that will lead, you know, very quickly to the Ministry of State Security knocking on that youngster's parent's house to say, well, you know, how is your son or daughter going in their studies in Australia? Should they come back? You know, we're concerned about th their political attitudes. So this, this overall um, system of surveillance and control is being, I think, lifted to uh, a, a new sort of Orwellian level, but actually a, a level of, of control that George Orwell could not have imagined because it's, it's being, it's being um, run through... Um, the Internet of Things uh, and industrial control devices uh, in a way that, you know, no dictatorship of the 1930s or 40s would have been able to do. That, you raise that very interesting issue of the enormous uh, capacity of modern technology to help in the state control of citizens, mm, mm. which is one of the things that's changed since the earlier days. And we have now, for example, a virtual global public square care of the Internet alone. But in many ways, the trade war between America and China seems to be about technology transfer of information, stealing of information, who owns it, who wins the technology war. How do we protect ourselves from this uh, uh, inappropriate use of technology, whether it's stolen or whether they simply seek to deploy technologies that they've developed themselves to influence us yes. and our citizens and our way of life and our political processes? We're going to have to get a, a, a lot more savvy and careful about how we do business with China around technology. And we're going to have to work much harder to protect our universities uh, and our businesses from intellectual property theft, uh, mostly through cyber hacking, but also using good old fashioned um, human intelligence sources as well, in which China is, uh, is, is very active. You know, China has for decades been engaged essentially in wholesale property theft from the West of technology um, in, in a way which has been the number one priority of their intelligence services and to which they have put cyber technology very quickly and, and very effectively. Um, e even outside of the world of espionage, John, there's, there's also... Um, you know, quite blatant techniques that uh, uh, the Communist Party has used when um, companies from developed democracies seek to do business in China. Um, it, it will often come at the price of saying well, you have to team with the Chinese partner and you have to provide your intellectual property to the partner for that, that um, technology to be advanced in, in China. And, and, you know, the, the experience of that has been, it's very, been very hard for a lot of Western companies to actually make money in China or, or indeed to find that their IP is actually being used by uh, Chinese entities. Um, you know, there is wholesale um, Chinese spying on Australian universities and, and businesses, uh, which I think we've been amazingly casual about. I sometimes think that perhaps uh, our academic institutions and the people who, who uh, make them up are not as strongly supportive of our own culture and its values as they might be and sometimes are decidedly soft uh, on um, some of the alternatives which are, we're now realising are not as attractive as we might have once thought. I think that has been true in a lot of the social science faculties where there's there's a tendency to want to equate a moral equivalence or, or a lack of moral equivalence between uh, the sort of the developed democracies um, and, and China. 
uh, which I find, um, you know, disturbing. But probably more serious even than that, John, has, has simply been that, you know, our universities have seen uh, the People's Republic as being nothing but a business opportunity. Uh, and, you know, the, the claim has been, well, we've had to go to China to find fee-paying students to pay for the research that we need to do because the federal government won't provide us with all of the research funding that we want. And the result of that is almost without exception, every Australian university is now um, financially dependent on that flow of large numbers of fee-paying Chinese students into their university systems. Uh, quite a few universities, for example, Monash University, have established campuses in, uh, in China. Uh, and the, the, the sort of pressure to see this as a money-making opportunity, I think, has blinded our university administrators to, to some of the risks that come, for in, come from intellectual property protection. When you have a Chinese state that's so interested in basically stealing all of the IP that it, that it can get. Uh, so th there's a real challenge there. You know, how do we break this economic dependence which our universities have built on China? And how do we, um, frankly, help the universities to understand that they, they have some serious IP protection that they need to, uh, need to engage in? Uh, it, my, my institute, um, Aspie, did, did a, a, a piece of original research about the numbers of uh, Chinese academics on faculty in major Western universities because it's emerged that um, this is another thing that universities sh should be concerned about as well. Hiring uh, Chinese faculty without doing enough due diligence to realise that these are people with intelligence connections and links back to the People's Liberation Army. Um, and we found that, in fact, um, two Australian universities, the Australian National University in Canberra and the University of New South Wales in Sydney, are actually in the top 10 globally for having Chinese academics on faculty with undeclared links to the PLA and to Chinese intelligence agencies which you can track back if you look closely enough at, at their background. I mean, on, on this, let me just say, you know, my, my concern here is, is with the predatory behaviour of the Chinese Communist Party. It's, it's not with Chinese people. Uh, and I think we have to make a very um, clear distinction about, about that. Um, but it is the party which is dominating. It's the, it's the party which sets intelligence priorities and military priorities. And um, in Australia, we just have to stop thinking of China as being nothing but economic opportunity, um, at least if we don't take into account the, the strategic risk that comes along with being too dependent. There's a couple of really important issues here. One is, I don't think we in Australia stop and think carefully enough about how free we actually are. I'm not saying we're a perfect society, mm. but my goodness, we've got it good, you know, and we don't want to give that up. And this idea that somehow or other the endless generation of more money is the golden objective overlooks the fact that, as Kissinger put it, if you lose a little trade, you may be able to get it back again somewhere else or renegotiate things, lose your freedom and you'll never get it back. Yes. We need to understand and be a bit more hard-nosed, I think, about the world we live in. Yeah, um, that would include academia, in my yeah, view, I, I, or much I, of academia. I, th I think it's going to take something of a shock to the system for, for that moment to arise in uh, the thinking of Australian governments and Australian people. And, and by that I mean, uh, you know, one or two Australian universities may have to go to the wall, they may have to be declare themselves bankrupt because all of a sudden Chinese student numbers dry up. Um, and that could happen not necessarily by a decision of the party. It could happen because Chinese families' tastes for where they want to educate their children um, change. In fact, is is changing. Um, but yes, I, I agree. I, I, I think um, there's a level of complacency in Australia that we should be worried about now. This sense of disconnection from uh, supporting our, our government and, and our democratic system that you mentioned that has been identified in that Lowy poll I think is, is really worrying. Uh, you know, I, th I think it routinely tells us that there's about a, a third, if not more, of people uh, 
under 30 don't regard democracy as being important any longer. And, you know, one sort of feels that you can only come to that view if you live in a democracy and you're not actually um, being personally challenged by the reality of what authoritarianism looks like. But um, all across the West, uh, I think in the uh, US with the arrival of Trump and the sort of drain the swamp uh, view of uh, the American system with the UK and Brexit, uh, with so much of Europe um, sort of uh, seeing support move away from the mainstream political parties. And in Australia, where we have this revolving door of prime ministers and ministers and people sort of dis disengaged from politics, that, that's pretty unhelpful. Um, and, you know, um, if, if you want to think of analogies, I mean, look, look at where we are right now. We have authoritarianism rising throughout the world. We have the democracies looking introverted and not wanting to engage. When's the last time you saw that? It was, it was the 1930s, the late 1930s. So I, I think this is a really um, risky mix for us. Um, and it's quite a change from what we were all talking about 15 or so years ago with the end of history. You know, Francis Fukuyama's argument that everyone was going to turn, every country was going to turn into a liberal democracy. Well, in fact, everything since then has moved in the opposite direction. Uh, authoritarianism is on the rise, the democracies are being challenged, and I think that gives, you know, should give people real concern for prospects for war and peace uh, in, in coming years. There would be those who would say, well, we're powerless, we're only 25 million people, we can't do anything about it. What's your view? I, you'd expect me to say I, I don't agree with that. I, I, I think Australia, um, if it wants to, uh, can play um, a, a significant leading role, not just in the region, but, but globally, um, if, if we're prepared to step up to those types of leadership challenges. So, you know, we are, I, I think, uh, you know, in, in broad terms about the world's um, 13th or 14th largest economy. About the uh, same size as Russia, yeah, we're, which is we're, a global power. Which is a global power, um, and and a lot more constructive, frankly, in how we approach the world than the than the Russians do. We're about the the world's thirteenth or fourteenth largest um, spender on uh, on the military technology, major donor of um, development assistance around the world. Australia is, in fact, at at the sort of upper end of the middle power range of countries, with a history of choosing to involve ourselves in global security, going back even bef before Federation. Um, what I think I see in Canberra is, is a willingness to step up to that, that kind of um, way of thinking about ourselves on the world stage. And um, uh, my interpretation of, of what's going on is that there was a, a period briefly uh, during the East Timor uh, crisis and our stabilisation operation, um, Iraq uh, and Afghanistan after 9-11, where Australia was heavily involved. Um, you know, our military was um, as tasked overseas and as stressed as, as it had been since the high point of the Vietnam War. And I think people came out of that feeling a, a bit tired and not really wanting to do any of the heavy lifting in our own region. It was expensive. S soldiers could die. Governments had, you know, hard, difficult decisions to make. And so for a decade, we've, we've just kind of not been doing that. Um, and we talk a big game, you know. We have this image that somehow we lead in the South Pacific and that Southeast Asia listen, listens to us. But... Really, uh, not not so. Not not unless we're prepared to actually back that up with you know practical engagement, serious defence capability, um, and I, I think we've just been avoiding those tough judgment calls. Australians, I think, perhaps it's an admirable quality, but they assume that everyone's like us. They're basically friendly. They're nice people. The evidence is rapidly mounting that, as history confirms, you should never assume any such thing. In fact, it's an old Chinese saying, isn't it? If you if you want peace, prepare for war. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're spending what now about one point nine percent of GDP on defence. Uh, you'd want to know clearly what you thought the threats were to increase it, but I haven't met a serious observer of the scene who knows what they're talking about who hasn't said we need to lift it. We need to lift it quickly. 
uh, and we need to show some more confidence in ourselves. In fact, the way Australians have done in the past, mm. Mm. not so much in the 30s, we seem to be asleep at the wheels, but a, a very small nation on a bipartisan basis got itself surprisingly ready for the terrible times of the First World War. Yes, yes. Look, there's, there's two things I'd like to um, s sort of react to in, that, in those comments there, John. What, what one is, um, I, I think we're, we've become a bit too complacent about our own qualities as, as, a, as a nation. You know, I've, I've had cause over the last few years to get, to get really quite disheartened about what I see as being core Australian values rather, as, as, as demonstrated rather than the, the values that we think that we bring to the world. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, a huge amount of venality, chasing after money, uh, and a willingness to compromise things that we might otherwise regard as being core Australian beliefs, support for human rights, for example, uh, that uh, to me suggest that, you know, we, we're kind of forgetting some of those qualities that, you know, made us such a an effective country over many decades from, from the end of the, the Second World War. Um, on, on the defence spending point, 1.9% uh, in, in one sense of uh, gross national product is, is a lot of money. That's about $40 billion uh, uh, this current year, just a shade under. Uh, but in practical terms, if you say, what does that buy you? Um, it buys you about two thirds of a decent sized crowd at the MCG about 65,000 people in uniform. That's what the size of the Defence Force is, uh, which is you know, very small by Asia-Pacific standards. Uh, in fact, I, I can tell you that you know, the, uh, the Americans as our closest ally are astonished by the numbers of aircraft that we can field and ships and submarines that we can sort of put to sea with, with the smallness of the, the force we have uh, to sustain them. But, um, I think that the mistake that we've made, the government has made um, over the last few years has been to put all of its attention on thinking about those big equipment decisions that have to be taken to equip our force in 15 and 20 years time. So the, the, these are the submarines, uh, the, the Anzac frigate replacements, none of which we will see until um, you know, the mid 2030s at best. And, and you know, to <laughs> imagine if the Bruce government had said to uh, Supermarine in 1938, um, look, just slow down on the Spitfires, we don't need them until 1948. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. I mean, we're, it, it, it's, it, it's, not, it's not anything that's geared to a sense that we may have to face a conflict in a much shorter time frame. And, and so, if, if I could interrupt again there, yeah. it's more than necessarily just the, the issue we might face one. Surely we need the deterrent power now that comes from looking like we really believe in ourselves and we carry some clout yes. that would maximise our chances of avoiding such a conflict? Uh, it w I think a stronger defence force is a powerful deterrent to complicating how a potential enemy think, thinks about yeah. us. And, and ideally, what you want them to do is to decide it's not worth, it's not worth the effort. I mean, I, I don't want to decry the current capabilities of the defence force. And in my professional career, the ADF that we have now is the best equipped that it has been in, in 30 years, with small packets of, of military capability, but, but very high quality packets of capability. The, the, the big problem for me is, let, let's just imagine, say, you know, in the worst of all possible worlds, that we are heading towards a military conflict sometime in 2021 or 2022, which is quite likely, you know, there are scenarios that I could paint for you around Taiwan or the South China Sea or North Korea that, that could very easily see conflict break out in that time scale. And, and then the question that a government should be asking of its senior military leadership is, well, if that's a possibility, how well prepared are we now to deal with that situation? And what should we be doing differently to get the Defence Force up to speed in that kind of 12 to 24 month time frame? Now, I, I can tell you no one is having that discussion in Canberra right now. You're kidding? Uh, uh, absolutely not, no, because the, the overwhelming focus of government attention uh, 
and, and, and therefore of Defence Department attention has been on designing the perfect force for the, for the 2040s. Um, and, you know, to go back to I your... I find that deeply disturbing. Well, um, to, to go back to your questions about defence white papers, you know, there's, there's two things that every white paper has to do. It's got to plan for the future force and it's got to maintain the current force. And, and my argument has been we're not really focusing on the current force right now because all of the investment dollars are going into the things that will give us, you know, the perfect middle size defence force of, of the 2030s and 40s. But, you know, my question is, well, what about that conflict that we might have to fight, you know, in the next few years? So, you know, this is why ASPE is running a conference in a couple of months' time on war in 2025. It's not because we like the idea of it, it's because we think we're not thinking hard enough about how to prepare for that. E even with the view of saying that good, good preparation might deter a conflict from actually reaching our, our shores. An important element of that preparedness for something to happen in the near future would appear to me to be the fact that as a nation we've been simply driving a sleep at the wheel in relation to fuel security. You can't run anything. You can't run an economy to keep the place going to support a military, let alone keep a military going without fuel. Yes. And because we've banned exploration and development of our own resources all over the place, because we no longer have much refining capacity, our crude uh, de you know, de self-sufficiency is at very, very low levels, we're importing virtually all of our crude, some of it to be refined here, or as refined product through the southern end of the South China Seas, I mm. might note. We don't have our strategic reserves in place. Surely that's a story of a nation that's not, not, not energised properly about yes. its security? It, it should be a scandal and, you know, almost the subject of Royal Commission type territory. Uh, because the, the, the biggest strategic story is, is that we've allowed our capacity for domestic fuel storage to wither away to almost zero. Uh, and in, in, instead that has been replaced with a, a just-in-time approach which basically um, sees um, oil being brought to us uh, from our major um, international suppliers. Uh, on, on a ticket system, as it's called. So we, we purchase the product and it, it gets uh, delivered through um, tanker vessels. Um, to give you one example of how dire that situation is, uh, jet fuel. So in a military conflict, you need lots of jet fuel to help your Air Force do what Staggering it, what it needs to do. Um, on, on the best possible um, counting, which includes the small amounts of stocks we have in Australia, what's at sea and what's bought, we have probably about two weeks supply of jet fuel. Um, now, where it comes from is important too, because you know it used to be that a lot of this sort of came from the Middle East, was refined in Singapore and came down to Australia. That, that's now changed. Um, about a third of our jet fuel comes from South Korea about 25% comes from Japan, uh, about 6 or 7% comes from China, in fact. So two-thirds of it, in other words, is going to come from North Asia through the South China Sea, right, the thing that's now controlled by uh, Chinese air power, um, to Australia. Uh, now, last year, when um, things were starting to look pretty grim on the, on the Korean Peninsula, I, I, I started to make a few public comments about the risk that was inherent in our supplies coming from this location. Because the scenario I was, I was thinking about is uh, what happens if uh, one of um, Kim Jong-un's midget submarines uh, sinks a tanker uh, uh, coming out of a South Korean harbour? Um, you know, the immediate thing that would happen is that those sh shipping companies would not put to sea. Um, and so almost from the beginning of a Korean Peninsula crisis, we would be forced in Australia to institute rationing for jet fuel, um, and indeed for all other categories of fuel as well. And, and the first thing that will happen is that the Defence Force will come to government and say, right, we want to have first dibs at, at access to that. So domestic flying will stop very quickly. 
um, all because of our dependence on a, on a just-in-time fuel supply system. Despite just, our international agreement to have 90 days reserves. Yes, that's aside. right, which we're well, well short of and, and indeed one of the few countries that has sort of completely ignored uh, those, those um, sort of benchmarks for what is adequacy of, of fuel I picked stocks. up on the grapevine that some of our allies are pretty unimpressed. Uh, well, hardly surprising. I mean, if, if you, uh, not that they're an ally, but a very close partner, Japan, um, you know, has, has months and months of uh, fuel, fuel stocks. I mean, we've done this because it's cheap and Australia is very attracted to doing things because it's cheap uh, and the cost of creating the fuel farms necessary to give us those 90 days of supplies will be enormous. So it's a problem that government has not wanted to look at. Well, you've also got green activism preventing us from exploring and developing our own. Yes. But then, as we know, it's Green's policy to break the American alliance, to uh, basically leave us completely vulnerable. They apparently believe that everybody will always be nice to Australia. That's What is extraordinary about that to me is that there are so many educated Australians mm. in secure service uh, and government type jobs who fall for that sort of sheer lunacy. Yes. Yes, well, the, Green, the Greens' published defence policy going into the election is a disaster and, and would leave Australia completely vulnerable. I mean, the good news is it, it, it's not going to ever... They will never have an opportunity to implement that. Uh, but I think it's critical that we sustain an interest in defence policy on the, on the part of those parties of the sensible centre, um, which means um, not, not simply the centre-right, but centre-left as well. It's absolutely vital that um, the Labor Party, as, as it does, as it, as it says it does, you know, as a strong supporter of the US alliance, um, I, I do worry about, you know, how that is, is going to last, you know, over the next 10, 15 years in Parliament where there seems to be sort of, you know, a changing uh, demographic effect on how the parties think about some of these issues. But um, yes, you're right. Uh, 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 you know, the, the the big problem is that no one's really focused on these issues at all. I mean, it's been completely absent in terms of anything, any debate in, in the lead up to the election or, or the campaign. Um, and does one almost thinks that there's a bit of a conspiracy of silence to say let's not talk about these issues because some of them are so hard. Yeah, but they're incredibly important. Yeah, we live in a region, you know, one of the most important in the world. It's uh, interesting to me just to contemplate how other countries are approaching this. Uh, Japan, for example, must feel very threatened and very concerned, and they are plainly moving away from a defence force that is purely for home defence. Where does Japan fit into all of this? Japan is a sort of a, a reluctant uh, middle power, I think would be how I'd describe it. There, there's still a very strong sense within their populations of the importance of a, a, a peace constitution, of not wanting to uh, use the self-defence force in peacekeeping, for example. There's a huge degree of um, allergy in, in uh, uh, Japanese popular thinking about taking casualties, for example. Um, but Strategically, Japan is being pushed into, I think, becoming a stronger military player to protect its own interests. And China is, is, a, is a, the, probably the number one strategic problem. But their geography also um, connects them to Russia. Um, and they continue to have uh, you know, a very difficult relationship with uh, both, Korean, uh, both countries on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, 1% of defence spending, if you're the Japanese economy, actually buys quite a lot. And um, if you look at their Navy and Air Force in particular, they're, they're very strong. M my big concern about Japan is the importance of keeping them part of the US alliance network. Um, the, the day that Tokyo concludes that they can't rely on America anymore as, as a key backer of their security, um, is probably the day before Japan decides to acquire nuclear weapons. Um, and I, I personally don't think that would be a good development for the region. I, I much prefer the idea that America is the sort of uh, nuclear power uh, that's ma managing nuclear, the nuclear balance in the Asia Pacific. So um, sustaining that alliance relationship to keep Japan in and to keep them confident of America's support is, is critical. And I would observe from many years in public life that 
Australia can play a very constructive role there mm, mm. in terms of keeping America involved and committed to us and to the region. And a big part of that is that we have to take our own defence seriously. Yes. America needs to know we've got our strategic oil reserves in place. Yes. They need to know that we are serious about a modern submarine fleet and about missile defence and a decent sized army and a decent, I mean, it's certainly we've got a very powerful little air force about to become more powerful, but not big enough. Mm. Let's be blunt, it's not big enough. Mm. We need the Americans to recognise that we are absolutely committed to peace in the region, and that mm. means that we're prepared to stand up for it mm. and work with them. I, I would agree with that. Um, I, you know, I'm personally not particularly a fan of um, the current president, Donald Trump, but Trump is right when he's said that allies are not pulling their weight. He's really meant NATO for the most part, but I think, you know, we, we can't afford to get complacent that America uh, thinks that we're necessarily doing everything we should do. The Americans uh, in their military establishment and in their intelligence establishment have a pretty high regard for us. And, and what they'll say to you uh, if you go and talk to people in the Pentagon is, well, we like Australians because on in military operations, they will be at the front of the fight. You know, they don't just sort of sit on their packs back at base. So, so they see us as being prepared to do tough things. I, I think there's less confidence around, is our government doing everything it should do on spending, uh, on military capability? And, you know, there we should understand that there, there, there is a, a little doubt that, you know, are we really serious enough? Uh, frankly, there's also an American concern that somehow we're, we're not thinking hard enough about Communist Party in China and what that means for the security of the region. So there's there's a bit of alliance mending, I think, that has to be done with Australia demonstrating its credentials to uh, to the US. Finally, uh, Indonesia, fourth most populous nation in the world, uh, largest Muslim nation in the world. They must look askance at the human rights abuses in the concentration camps in China today, full of uh, Muslims, uh, a rising uh, economic power, likely to be the fourth or fifth largest economy by the middle of this century, our closest neighbour. How do we work constructively with Indonesia? It seems to me to be incredibly important to our future. Uh, we have regular hiccups in the relationships, mm. some of them overblown, but they do, I think, signify that we're better at knocking on the door than we are walking through the door properly <laughs> yes. in terms of engagement. Yes, you know, we've, Australia's been talking for um, all, all my time, all my professional life as a, as a public servant about the importance of having a strategic relationship with Jakarta, whatever, whatever that means, a closer relationship, a deeper relationship. And, and yet the truth of the matter is, is that with, with almost clock-like regularity over 10 years, we've had a major crisis in relations which has pushed the two countries apart. And um, it then takes some years to actually get back to close engagement in, in a way that um, might actually make us more effective partners than we are. But my, my concern is that, you know, if you take that as, as a precedent, looking from Indonesian independence up until now, the, the, the most likely future, instead of that closer partnership, is that we're just going to sort of bump along a fairly baseline low level of engagement that's not delivering that much. And that really would be a shame, John, if, that, if that's the future, because, uh, I, but I think to change it, what, what it will take is a big step forward, which really only Australia is going to be prepared to do, to try to build a stronger partnership in military and intelligence and political terms with, with Indonesia. So I, I would like to see, you know, a future Australian government seriously commit to say, we're going to work with the Indonesian military. Uh, to help the, their navy, for example, patrol their waters more effectively, which, if you think about it, is really in our interests. You know, it'd be a fine thing if they could do that. We have much from a border show. protection. Our point common of view. interests are much more broadly, surely. Yeah, yeah. Um, important than is generally recognised. Yeah. So look, I, I feel that it's it's a relationship that up up until now has has never really ceased to disappoint. But if we're if we're going to get any better. It's, it's going to require Australia to be um, on the front foot going to Indonesia with big ideas, uh, 
and, the, and a willingness to spend some money to assist them to strengthen their own capabilities, their military capabilities. And yet it's becoming a very rapidly, uh, very rapidly becoming a very wealthy country uh, and uh, with you know, a very large number of people, uh, I would have thought it's not far off the point where if it's so decided, it could become a major military force in its own right. Yeah, um, well, it, would, it, it will be starting almost with a blank sheet of paper because the, the capabilities of their force is very, very limited. They've, they've not invested really beyond uh, building an army with the ability to sort of function throughout the, uh, the archipelago. Um, in every other area, what, what you'll see is, um, uh, to be honest, um, a lot of corruption in making decisions around acquisition of aircraft and ships, which have not helped them to do the practical things that you'd want an Indonesian Air Force and, and Navy to do. Um, uh, it, it's probably the areas where our cooperation has been most effective in the last 20 years has been in police and intelligence. Uh, but even that starts to erode um, over over time, and so I think what's needed is you know a major Australian effort of investment to try to secure that closer relationship, because you know at the widest level our strategic interests are broadly the same. Yes, and I think that's um, often overlooked. Yeah, I, I I think so too, and. Um, you know, it looks like from the uh, Indonesian election that uh, the voting is now um, uh, being counted as, as we speak, that uh, President Jokowi is back. I, I wouldn't say he's been the most effective foreign policy president, but if he's there for a second term, that should make him feel comfortable. And I think this could be the right moment for us to re-engage with an agenda for, OK, so how can we make this relationship better than it has been? Peter, thank you very much indeed. I think what you've said has been incredibly uh, informative, but also concerning. And it should be something of a call to arms. We need to keep attempting to focus people's minds on what we have that we want to preserve in this country, rather than the constant focus on what we think we don't have. John, thanks. It's been, uh, it's been great fun. And I, I've really relished the chance to have a conversation with you about the, the big strategic issues because, as you've said, frankly, we're just not having it enough these days in town. Thank you. Thank you.